Let's open our Bibles tonight to the Gospel of Mark, Mark chapter 9, Jesus' revelations. The Lord's going to reveal four things in this study. He's going to reveal his person, who he really is. He's going to reveal his power. He's going to reveal his humility. And he's going to reveal his purity. Person, power, humility, purity. As always, let's ask the Lord to help us. Father, we're grateful for your study and we're going to ask you to really just get a hold of us. Help me to step out of the way and help us to see Jesus. Holy Spirit, really bring forth your word in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, chapter 9 of Mark. Um, it's always good when you're reading a chapter to go back a verse or two of the preceding chapter because these books were not written by chapters, as you know. They were just written all together. So let's get a little bit of a, um, a head start. Um, the Lord is talking about taking up his cross and following him and uh, not being ashamed of him. And uh, now in chapter 9, he says, Assuredly, I say to you that there are some standing here who will not taste death till they see the kingdom of God present with power. That's interesting. These men were going to uh, see the presence of God's power um, and the manifestation of it. Not all of them, but several of them would. And the next verse tells you how that happened to be. So this has to do with the kingdom of God being present with power. We're going to see the Lord Jesus in his kingdom power state. The millennium uh, is going to be in view here, how the Lord's going to appear. And uh, this will show you uh, how that's manifested, beginning in verse 2. After six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John and led them up on a high mountain apart by themselves, and he was transfigured before them. His clothes became shining, exceedingly white like snow, such as no launderer on earth can whiten them. And Elijah appeared to them with Moses, and they were talking with Jesus. Then Peter answered and said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here, and let us make three tabernacles, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah, because he did not know what to say, for they were greatly afraid. And a cloud came and overshadowed them, and a voice came out of the cloud, saying, This is my beloved Son, hear him. Suddenly, when they had looked around, they saw no one any more, but only Jesus with themselves. Now as they came down from the mountain, he commanded them that they should tell no one the things they had seen, till the Son of Man had risen from the dead. So they kept this word to themselves, questioning what the rising from the dead meant. And they asked him, saying, Why do the scribes say that Elijah must come first? Then he answered and told them, Indeed, Elijah is coming first and restores all things. And how is it, how is it written concerning the Son of Man that he must suffer many things and be treated with contempt? But I say to you that Elijah has also come and they did to him whatever they wished, as it is written of him. So the Lord is here manifesting himself in his kingdom glory. And he is literally transfigured before them. The word transfigure comes from the Greek word, and we get our word metamorphosis, where it's the same entity but a total change. Two weeks ago, we were walking on the path in the woods, my dogs and I, and I saw this little caterpillar. I wanted to make sure I didn't step on it, and then I had to worry about the three dogs with four feet each, each of us getting past that poor caterpillar, because I was hoping and believing that that caterpillar would turn into a butterfly. Same entity, but totally different appearance. I didn't see a tadpole that day, but had I seen that tadpole, I might have thought about him one day becoming a frog. So here's a metamorphosis, a total change. The Lord promises us, if we are in Christ, that we are going to have a change as well. These bodies will be 
turned into resurrection bodies and they're going to have power. And so here we find the Lord being transfigured and it's a total change. His clothes become shining, uh, white like snow, even whiter than your launderer can get your laundry. Um, I think about Peter, James, and John. He took these same three to uh, the raising of Jairus' daughter from the dead. Uh, he didn't take the others in. Uh, he will take these three in the Garden of Gethsemane uh, deeper into the garden where he's going to pray and have them watch and pray. Uh, and you wonder why he chose these three. And from all evidence I find in Scripture, there's no indication as to why he did that. He chose them because he chose them. And uh, if I were the Lord, I would think James is not a good bet because I'm bringing him into a deeper experience of teaching and he'll be martyred within a matter of months after I die. I'll get no mileage out of this man. That's human reasoning. And then Peter, with all due respect, he has hoof and mouth disease like nobody else has. Of course, the others go along and say much the same thing. He's a leader, but man, does he mess up. Uh, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God, he says. Hallelujah. The Father has given that. Far be it from you to go to the cross, he says a few seconds later. Get behind me, Satan. So why would he choose Peter? And then why would he choose, choose John? James and John were the fellows who wanted to burn all of the Samaritans because the Samaritans kind of snubbed their nose when they were walking through. Lord, give us permission to bring down fire from heaven. No. God chooses who he wants to. Why did he choose me? I don't waste my time thinking about that one. I think he just did it for humor or something. But he loves us and he chooses whom he'll choose. And I mentioned this. There's somebody around the corner who has a ministry that we're envious of. We wish we were somebody else. Don't go there. He chooses whom he will choose. I struggled in the early days of my walk and my ministry. I'd see people on television like me or on the radio, and I'd think thoughts I don't even want to share with you. And the Lord had to take me to the woodshed and say, I'm the one who will judge them. Don't you be judgmental. You pray for those people. And so we don't wonder why God chooses this person for this or that person for that. That's his business. All we do is what we're supposed to do. In any event, he is transfigured before them, and these three men suddenly see not just Jesus, but Elijah, the prophet, and Moses, the great pastor who led Israel through the wilderness. Moses died, brought the law, and then he died, and he's been dead for about 1,500 years as of this writing, or this appearance. And suddenly he's back. Now Elijah was the great prophet, representing the prophets, and he's been dead for close to a thousand years. Another gospel writer tells us that they are discussing the Lord's death. Very fitting that both Moses and Elijah should be there because both Moses and the law speak of the coming one. In fact, Moses did say, there will come a prophet, hear him, referring to the Lord Jesus. And then Elijah was certainly coming in the power of the Lord. And Malachi tells us in the very closing verses that Elijah is going to come again before the second coming of the Lord. So Moses represents the law. Elijah represents the prophets. Together, it's the whole Bible, and it speaks of the Lord Jesus and his death and his power and his resurrection. The very closing words of the Old Testament in Malachi Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. So the Lord's talking to these men about his death and how his death and resurrection will fulfill all of the Old Testament. Now, Peter has to get in there, doesn't he? He just has to open his mouth. And I love this expression, uh, for he did not know what to say. Uh, I've been like that too. You get into an awkward situation, you're at a party, you're in a strange environment, don't know what to say. When you don't know what to say, open your mouth and just talk and hope that in the volume of words, something reasonable will come out. Kind of like going to Las Vegas and hope you're going to win, right? Uh, if we would just learn to shut up when we don't know what we're talking about and ask for wisdom. But he's got to get right in there. And so he makes a comment. 
which is half right. But half right's not good enough, is it? Why is it half right? He senses that the Lord is manifesting his kingdom glory, the same glory he's going to have in the millennium. And Peter knows enough that the Feast of Tabernacles, which is in late September, early October, when you see your Jewish neighbors, if they're Orthodox and they have sticks in kind of a TP fashion, or it could even be a square, they are making a tabernacle and they will invite you in for a meal and they'll have their meals in that little temporary booth. Tabernacles, celebrated at th that time and even now, speaks of two things. It speaks of looking back to the journey through the wilderness with Moses for 40 years and how God provided safe dwelling for them for 40 years. But Tabernacles also looks forward to the millennium, to the peace, to the fulfillment of life after this life. And so Tabernacles would be an appropriate answer, except he wasn't told to say that. And we learned this on Sunday, you don't do anything unless the Lord tells you to do it. No ministry, no suggestions, it's a waste of time. So you only do what you're supposed to do. Peter is going to have to learn something which we all have to learn. How many ever were servers in a restaurant? We used to call them waiters and waitresses, now they call them servers. Did you ever do any serving? I, I hope you were taught in the process that uh, you really wait until you're called upon and then you execute what you're asked to execute and you don't get into a whole lot of suggestions and telling people what they should be doing. Uh, a waiter or a server is there in fact, in these days, when they had a private server, they would just, as Psalms would say, my hand, or the, your eye is on my hand. Lord, may I look at your hand and just do whatever you tell me to do. A good waiter is watching, or a good waitress is watching for direction and then executes it and then goes back and waits. So don't move unless the Lord tells you to move. And then when he tells you to move, do what he tells you to do. Bad timing, bad suggestion, Peter. Be quiet. <laughs> well, their eyes are on Elijah and Moses. With all due respect to Jesus, they see him 24-7. They've lived with him now for a couple of years, and they love the Lord, but he's not new. Elijah and Moses are new. They've never seen these fellows before. And incidentally, how do they know that they are Moses and Elijah? We don't have the answer to that, but they somehow are drawn into that kingdom experience and they're able to recognize people who have gone on. Moses died. Elijah was simply translated. Um, his chariot was caught up and he disappeared, but they just knew him because we're going to know all things hereafter and they're kind of entering into a, an experience of almost what it's like to be in heaven. And um, they uh, are looking at them and they're excited about it. And uh, the Lord, the, the Father has to come on in and kind of break this little party up. A cloud comes and overshadows them. So their eyes are on Moses and Elijah. And this huge cloud comes and envelops them so that God can get their eyes off of Elijah and Moses and get them back on Jesus. So the cloud comes, overshadows them, and here's the voice from heaven. This is my beloved son. Hear him. Get your eyes off of anything and anyone else. Get your eyes on Jesus. And suddenly when they had looked around, they saw no one anymore, but only Jesus with themselves. So that cloud descended just to get their eyes off of Elijah and Moses, Exit Elijah and Moses, no one is left but Jesus. That's a good lesson for us as well. You know, I love Jesus and uh, he's with me all the time. And he's with you if you're in Christ. But oh, this exciting evangelist. And don't you love this radio personality or television or, or this new book? And oh, and we get our eyes on people. And that's unfortunate. Because if somebody has something that's special, thank you, Jesus, and may I receive from that person, but it's always Jesus that I'm looking at, not anyone or anything else. So we need to get our eyes off of that. How about self? 
That becomes a problem for us, doesn't it? Jesus, I can't see you. All I can see is me. My problems, my needs, my this, my that. Get your eyes on Jesus. This is my beloved son. Hear him or see him. So we need to get our eyes back on the Lord. So as they have seen the Lord in power, it's changing them. And this is a very hard thing for them to do, but as they're coming down from the mountain, the Lord commands them they should tell no one the things they have seen. Can you imagine how hard that would be to go back and see the other nine and uh, you can't say a word about what happened up there? Well, what'd you see up there? Well, you know, nothing is said about that. He commands them to tell no one until the Son of Man had risen from the dead. And they kept the word to themselves, but they questioned in their hearts, about this rising from the dead, what it meant. Now that may seem silly to me because I'm looking back to the cross, but there before the cross, how many resurrections had they heard about? How many resurrections had they seen? None. And yet they still had to think about this and ponder it, and they still didn't understand it even after the resurrection took place. Even that Sunday evening when the Lord came, they still were not really believing it. They were in fear. The Lord asks us to do some things that are new. No precedent in our lives. Can we trust him when he tells us about it? Are we open to something totally new and totally uh, unpredictable? How is it going to work out? Actually, when you think about it, every day is totally new. And the circumstances are totally new. Can we trust him to work it out? We need to. So they asked Jesus about this. Why do the scribes say that Elijah must come first? Referring to that scripture I gave you in Malachi, why did they say that? We just saw Elijah. And why does he have to come first before you come back? Why? What's the purpose of that? And then Jesus answers in a very interesting way in verse 12. He answered and told them, Indeed, Elijah is coming first and restores all things. He will come before I return. And how it is, is it written concerning the Son of Man that he must suffer many things and be treated with contempt? That's true. The scriptures are very clear that I will be suffering many things. I'll be treated with contempt before my death. But I say to you that Elijah has also come and they did to him whatever they wished as it is written of him. And he's referring there to John the Baptist who in a sense came as Elijah, the scriptures say. Because Elijah came, or Elijah will come for the second coming of Christ. John the Baptist came for the first coming. He announced the coming of Jesus. So he kind of was dressed like him, a wild man and, and uh, hairy garments and uh, locusts and honey and all that. But the Lord had John the Baptist go before him for his first coming. He will have Elijah go before him for his second coming. And then I think one of the keys to Scripture is to put yourself in there somehow. It's not selfish. It's called application. John the Baptist for the first coming, Elijah for the second coming. Where does Jerry fit into this? How can I tomorrow announce the coming of Jesus to somebody who needs that information? Lord, give me the chance to share the good news of you and your coming with somebody who doesn't know you. Put, the, put yourself in there. Lord, I want to be a witness for you. And John the Baptist made straight the way for Jesus. I want to make straight the way for somebody to receive Jesus. Perhaps by praying for them, maybe answering a question, give my testimony. You need to find yourself in this picture somehow. And uh, this is how the Lord's going to appear in his wonderful state uh, in the millennium with power. And uh, it gives me a foretaste of my resurrection body as well and uh, how this body is going to be totally and completely transformed into a resurrection body for heaven. Little side note, often asked question, 
What does the Bible say about your funeral arrangements, about cremation versus burial? Answer, the Bible says nothing. And if you're in the ground 20 years, having been laid out in a beautiful casket, it doesn't make any difference if you were cremated or not. Cremation does in about an hour or two what nature is going to do in about 20 years, so it doesn't make a bit of difference. Uh, so that just answer that question. And um, if you don't know how the Lord's going to do it, I don't know, and I don't care. I don't really care. So uh, I've told the story before that I, my, my father's uh, ashes are here. We had him cremated. He's in the back uh, of the church. And um, I was dig. we had a hole dug for him, and we put his, his ashes right in there. And then the guy came to put the uh, stone in, and I thought he was digging deeper than we had the ashes put. So I got to be honest, I'm not sure where Pop is. I think half of him is here, and half's across the street up at the uh, Osborne Mill Nursery. And who knows and who cares, right? And then what about that body that was placed in a nice casket and put in the ground 30 years ago? And uh, now that's all completely uh, rotten, and maybe the casket is too, and it's gotten into the ground, and then it's gotten into the system, the soil system, and into the grass, and some cow ate uh, some of that grass and made some milk, and some baby ate the, drank the milk, and you get the idea. Only the Lord knows where we all are and can put it all together, but he can do it, amen? All right, that's the uh, person of the Lord. He's revealed himself as God hasn't he? And uh, he's revealed himself in that transformed state as God. He's also revealed himself as Lord when Jesus was uh, talking to Elijah and Moses and God said, get your eyes on my son. Hear him. In other words, he's Lord. Jesus is God, but he's also Lord. Oh, he's God, whether we want to acknowledge it or not. But is he Lord? Most people in the world think he's God. But is he actually their Lord? And then if you want to really stretch the definition of Lord or Master, somebody once said, if he's not Lord of all, he's not Lord at all. So Lord, be Lord of my life. And then he was a teacher because he taught them how to look for not only Elijah, but recognize the work of John the Baptist as the forerunner at the first coming. So there we've seen him as God and Lord and teacher in that little exercise there. Now let's look at his power. He's going to rebuke a demon, and he's going to teach the disciples something. Look at verse 14. And when he, had, when he came to the disciples, see, he came off the Mount of Transfiguration, and now they're coming back down to where the other disciples are, and there's a big commotion. And uh, he came, came down, and the, the scribes are arguing and disputing with, uh, with the disciples. Immediately when they saw him, all the people were greatly amazed, and running to him, they greeted him. And he asked the scribes, what are you discussing with them? Then one of the crowd answered and said, Teacher, I brought you my son who has a mute spirit. And wherever it seizes him, it throws him down. He foams at the mouth, gnashes his teeth, and becomes rigid. So I spoke to your disciples that they should cast it out, but they could not. He answered and said, O oh, faithless generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I bear with you? Bring him to me. Then they brought him to him. And when he saw him, immediately the spirit convulsed him, and he fell on the ground and wallowed, foaming at the mouth. So he asked his father, how long has this been happening to him? And he said, from childhood. And often he has thrown him both into the fire and into the water to destroy him. But if you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. Jesus said to him, if you can believe, all things are possible to him who believes. Immediately the father of the child cried out and said with tears, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. When Jesus saw that the people came running together, he rebuked the unclean spirit, saying to it, deaf and dumb spirit, I command you, come out of him and enter him no more. 
Then the spirit cried out, convulsed him greatly, and came out of him, and he became as one dead, so that many said, He is dead. But Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him up, and he arose. And when he had come into the house, his disciples asked him privately, Why could we not cast it out? So he said to them, This kind can come out by nothing but prayer and fasting. An amazing account. Coming off the glorious experience of the Mount of Transfiguration down into this demonic business with this spirit and the the crowd are all uh, fighting. The disciples are frustrated. They cannot get this uh, situation healed. And uh, what's the Lord going to do? This reminds me of how it is with you and me sometimes. We go off with the Lord in prayer, sweet hour of prayer, and then you come back out of that experience and all sorts of problems. And you think, wow, it was hardly worth going up on the mountain with the Lord. Look at the trouble that's facing me as I get down. No, quite to the contrary. The time of sweet hour of prayer was ready to help you to handle the situation when you come down off that experience. And when I say sweet hour of prayer, I don't mean a literal hour of prayer. Somebody once said that um, prayer should be more like a streetcar connection than a gasoline engine. You know, I used to, when I first got saved, have a gasoline engine approach to prayer, fill it up for an hour of prayer, and then just run all day until you go, oh, oh, at the end of the day. But that streetcar, going up and down those hills in San Francisco and other cities, it's always connected by cable, isn't it? It it never runs out of power. So sweet hour of prayer should be a streetcar, constant connection to the Lord. Anyway, they come down off that mountain and they've got the strength and the Lord shows them how to do it. Uh, Here's this demonic spirit. It is convulsing this young fellow. And uh, it's also a deaf and dumb spirit can't hear, can't speak, and he's got what appears to be epilepsy. We taught this in Matthew, and I got one dear sweet saint extremely upset with me. Oh, she was furious and angry with me. How dare you call epilepsy, which is what this appears to be, uh, a demonic spirit? Well, one thing you learn in ministry, when people get really exercised about something, Probably there's somebody in their family who's got a problem like that. And sure enough, her sister has epilepsy. Don't you tell me she has a demonic spirit. So I had to say, well, I'm going to tell you, this, this definitely looks like epilepsy here, the way this has been convulsing him. And I gave a testimony in that message, and I gave it to her as well. We had somebody on staff about 20 plus years ago, and he had had epileptic attacks. He was an epileptic. And one night, Thursday night study, just like this, his father-in-law was here. And his father-in-law was actually was outside the church, and he was bad-mouthing my associate pastor, who was my stepfather, Pastor Mort, who had been raised as an Orthodox Jew. He was Jewish by ethnic background. And this, young, this, this old man, he was 85, was making the most anti-Semitic comments about dad you could possibly imagine. Well, some people around the church were hearing this and they, they said, you know, he's really speaking against Pastor Morton, against all Jews. So we called the old man in and called this man with his wife, the daughter of this man. And we got him calmed down. And uh, I remember the scripture, when you deal with an older man, be gentle and kind. And I said, now that's not the way we treat Pastor Morton or anybody else. We don't have any ethnic attacks or slurs. We love all people. And uh, so I want you to ask Pastor Moore to forgive you for your ethnic uh, slander. Dad didn't care. He'd been, been slandered all of his life as a Jewish person and uh, by Christians among others. So uh, he didn't bother. But th- this man needed to be corrected about that. He was corrected. And all of a sudden, the son-in-law, the epileptic, went into a fit. Probably the exercise of emotions. Whatever. He went into a fit just like this, foaming, wallowing, and his tongue began to swallow his tongue. We got him on the floor, pulled his tongue out, and I rebuked that spirit, remembering this story, in the name of Jesus, get your hands off this man, come out of him now, be gone. And it began to just have some kind of reaction. I had another comment, be gone now in Jesus' name. And he jerked, and he went limp, and I thought he was dead. Just like this story. 
hardly seemed to be breathing, wasn't moving. But I knew that he was still alive. And I said, leave him alone, give him some air, let's pull back. And uh, about 10 minutes later, he came to, and he was fine. And he stayed on staff, and I knew him for another 10 years before he died. He never again had an epileptic attack. So, with all due respect to relatives of yours, if you're watching by television, you know, I'm not telling you you've got demonic spirits in your family or what have you, but all disease comes ultimately from the devil. We know that from Genesis chapter 3. And if I'm not sure if it's a demonic spirit or if it's a genetic problem, whatever, I'll take authority over anything I can find. Devil, gen genetic spirit, familiar spirit, disease, contagion, whatever, be gone in Jesus' name. I don't care. I'll just go after it all. And uh, so the Lord said, deaf and dumb spirit, I command you, come out of him and enter him no more. Hey, when you got the authority, you don't need to go on and on. I have found in prayer, especially in critical times like this, the longer the prayer, the less the faith. The shorter the prayer, the greater the faith. That's why I say get yourself built up before so that when there's a need, bam, you go right for it. In Jesus' name, that's it. But when you start in Genesis and you got to go, da, 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 you're trying to build your faith up. So do it on your own time. Pray, come on in, and be ready for business. I've mentioned again about that mother in the grocery store with that child who's acting up. No, honey, you shouldn't do that because your daddy's going to be upset and the manager of the children, da, 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 da. she has no more authority than the man in the moon. When she knows what she's doing, she'll say, Harvey, or whatever the poor kid's name is, knock it off. Or really, if she has power, she'll just point to her face and he knows she means business. So when you know that you know, your prayers are short and to the point. All right. This kind comes out by prayer and fasting. Sometimes you're going to have to pray a little bit more. You may have to fast. When you fast, fasting it tends to sharpen your edge of your prayer, your sword, and you're able to really get down to business. You starve yourself of a little food for a meal or two meals, but you're feeding yourself the Word of God. If you're going to fast, don't sit down and watch cartoons because you're not feeding yourself spiritually. Get into the Word of God and watch God really use you. All right, now verse uh, 30 Let's talk about humility, the humility of the Lord Jesus. They departed from there and they passed through Galilee. He did not want anyone to know it. Why? Because the crowds were so crushing, he couldn't move from point A to point B. He wanted to choose his own timing and his own agenda. He taught his disciples and said to them, The Son of Man is being betrayed into the hands of men and they will kill him. And after he is killed, he will rise the third day. But they did not understand this saying, and they were afraid to ask him. So he's telling them exactly what's going to happen in the future. I'm going to be betrayed, and they're going to kill me, and after they kill me, I will rise the third day. He told them that again and again and again. But they did not understand. No, they had no precedent about the resurrection, as we said before, and it scared them. Why? Probably because they would be without him. He would not be there always, and they were going to miss him. And they certainly saw wonderful power and teaching through him. What would life be like without him? In any event, it wasn't registering, and it didn't register on the resurrection day either. They just weren't picking that up. Now, if I'd been there... I would have been wise and smart and figured it all out, unlike those guys, right? No, I'd be no different than they, nor would you. The Lord has told me again and again, fear not, but I fear. Peace be still, but I get all agitated. And so I'm just like them. He warns us, he tells us, and we forget. And he has to tell us again, kind of like toddlers. You've got to tell them over and over and over. But he loves us and he doesn't mind doing that. So I list this as a sign of his humility because Philippians tells us what it was like for him to have to humble himself to go to the cross. Uh, in Philippians chapter 2 and verse 8, referring to Jesus, being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death 
even the death of the cross. His humbling himself was the most humbling of experiences. And then it goes on to say, but God has highly exalted him and given him the name above all other names. At the name of Jesus, every knee should bow and every tongue should confess that he is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So there is a wonderful act of humility. And he tells us to be humble. He says, if you want to be great in my kingdom, learn to be the servant of all. We, in the world, we try to start off at the top, don't we? But it doesn't work that way. You've got to start at the bottom and work your way up. And uh, he says, humble yourself and you'll be great. And then um, he goes on to talk about uh, humility in terms of greatness. There's this competition in the world, and his disciples were going through this competition. Look at verse 33. He came to Capernaum. That was his headquarters in the area of Galilee on the north uh, western shore. And he was in the house, and he asked them, what was it that you disputed among yourselves on the road? So as they were walking to the house, the guys were arguing. And Jesus asked what they were arguing about. But they kept silent, for on the road they had disputed among themselves who would be the greatest. And so they didn't want to tell him. Uh, this had happened many times before, and it's going to happen on the last night at the Last Supper. As a matter of fact, two of the boys, James and John, the inner circle, James and John, uh, along with Peter, their mother came and said to Jesus, now you're going to need somebody in the kingdom to sit on your right hand and someone on your left hand. And I think I know the boys that can do the best job for you. Ah, my sons. <laughs> and so uh, there's this, uh, this worldly approach that I want to be uh, high in, in, in front row. And so the Lord says, uh, I'll teach you about greatness. You want to know about that? And, uh, but first of all, he says, what are you disputing about? I think he knew. I think he knew why they were arguing, but he wanted to draw them out, and they kept quiet. Just like you get home after a busy day and the kids have gotten into it, in the cookie jar and the place is a mess. Who did it? What kid says, oh, I did it. I want to confess that, and uh, here's the paddle so you can give it to me, and I'm going to bend over and you can give me 20 wax. Yeah. They're, they're totally quiet, aren't they? Which one of you did it? Nobody opens his mouth. All right. They kept silent because they were trying to argue about who would be the greatest. Here are the fellows who are walking with Jesus, and he has just told them how he's going to humble himself by going to the cross to die for the sins of all mankind. And these guys, right after that, are just saying, I'll be bigger than you, I'll be better than you, I'll be on the right, etc." cetera. And um, we've got that competition in us as well. There's somebody who's got a ministry that we think we ought to have, and uh, they've got possessions we think we ought to have. And so we have to all admit that we go there at times. Well, he wanted to teach them. And so he sat down in verse 35, and he called the 12, and he said, If anyone desires to be first, he shall be last of all and servant of all. Then he took a little child and set him in the midst of them. And when he had taken him in his arms, he said to them, Whoever receives one of these little children in my name receives me, and whoever receives me receives not me, but him who sent me. So they're all about themselves and who's going to be the greatest, and he really, really sets forth the principle clearly. You want to be first? Then you learn to be last and be the servant of all. And uh, that's kind of against the world's principles. The world's principles are, if you want to be first, be quicker, brighter, get up earlier, work harder. And if you get a chance to elbow the other guy, kind of like the ladies in their roller derby business, you know, they try to knock each other off the track with the elbows. Well, that doesn't hurt either, as long as you don't get caught and fouled. So uh, get up and try harder than the next guy. No, learn to be servant of all because that's what it's going to take in God's kingdom. And uh, then he illustrates that by taking this child. He doesn't just set the child in the midst of them, right in the middle, so they all can see him. He actually takes the child 
in his arms. Notice the personality of Jesus. At other times we see that children want to be near him and the parents want for him to bless them and the disciples are saying, you know, get away. This is a drag. This is slowing us down. These kids shouldn't be bothering us. And so he has to uh, set the child there as an example. If you receive this little child, you've received me. You've received me, you've received the Father who has sent me. So he's really saying, guys, watch out for children. They're important. Take care of them and be like them. What's a child like? Well, a child is usually trusting. Oh, yeah, they're energetic. And uh, they can get into things and trash a, a, a room in a New York minute. We know that. But they're basically trusting and they're helpless. And they are looking for guidance and direction, whether they want to or not, they're going to get it. But uh, that's the attitude we ought to have. God, I can't do a thing without you. Lord, help me. Uh, I can't think without you. I can't do without you. Help me. And um, we need to treat these children well. Not only literal children, but what about the babe in Christ, the adult who's new in the Lord? And really, let's stretch it to everybody. Aren't we all children or should be? So we ought to really prefer each other over ourselves and try to serve each other. Not so long ago, I was reading an article, not a Christian article, but an article on the internet about how to avoid road rage. Have we all been there and done that? And uh, we learn to control our temper. And the article said, in order to avoid road rage, try to step back and think, how can I facilitate that other person's need? such as cutting me off and uh, running the light and zooming past, etc. And after you get over that anger, just say, what can I do to help that person? And it, it changed my attitude. I live uh, uh, over by Buckingham Pond and the St. Peter's Hospital area, and uh, we've got a several four-way four stop, no lights, but just four-way stop. And technically, I know the law, the one that gets there first, has the right of way. If they come at the same time, the guy on the right has the right of way. Well, that's the law. But how do I know the other guy knows or cares about the law? So what I do is I come to the four corners and I just motion, go right on ahead. I'm going to be a servant and let you go first. I'm such a nice guy. No, I like my car. I don't want to get my car all dented and what have you. But it's just, it's just easier. And so I come to the four corners expecting to prefer the other person, so I'm never irritated at all because I'm not expecting to be first. Um, so that's part of humility. And um, I often said, if you want to find out who is worthy to be a, a minister uh, of whatever sort, pastor or what have you, uh, there's an easy test. You get 10 people out there that want to become pastors, give me a big stack of papers, I'll come out and I will stumble on purpose in front of them drop them on the floor and watch. The one that gets on his knees first, that's my man. That's the one I want. The one that's going to pick up the papers, not the one that's going to sit back and say, when a big assignment comes, I'm going to take care of that. So learn to be a servant. And then as far as humility, let's learn to be loving and understanding of others. Verse 38, now John answered him saying, Teacher, we saw someone who does not follow us casting out demons in your name, and we forbade him because he does not follow us. And Jesus said, Do not forbid him, for no one who works a miracle in my name can soon afterward speak evil of me. For he who is not against us is on our side. For whoever gives you a cup of water to drink in my name, because you belong to Christ, Assuredly, I say to you, he will by no means lose his reward. So this is the same John who, along with his brother James, wanted to bring fire down from heaven because the, the uh, Samaritans were looking the other way and, and they been raising their noses against these guys. John's a tough guy. Not my pick for writing the greatest little epistle on love, 1 John. But this is young John, probably 25, 30. Older John is going to learn an awful lot. Love. That's what it's all about. But here he wants to uh, 
rebuke these guys because they're not part of my little denomination. Now, I think that God puts his light and blessing primarily on reach out fellowship, don't you? And that after that, it's just, everything's a step down from that. Well, actually, it's not just reach out fellowship. It's the guy who lives near Buckingham Pond. I think he's the greatest, don't you? And that's how we feel about ourselves. And that is what's called sectarianism, by the way. Uh, any other group is not really in the inner circle. We're the ones that are the chosen frozen. And um, this is not God. And what he's trying to do is break down these walls of separation. And I was noticing the other day as I was reviewing one of my tapes and editing it that uh, we were talking about the cloud in the back of the tabernacle. And I said, I've learned over many years in ministry that I don't really care anymore what denomination or no denomination a person is in. We have people here and on our prayer team and those who watch us and hear us and whatever. I don't care. We have all different kinds. What I'm looking for is one thing. Are you looking at the cloud? Are you looking at Jesus? Do you love Jesus? If you love Jesus and he's Lord of your life and he's the savior of your soul, we're brothers and sisters. That's all I'm looking for. Call yourself what you want, but it's Jesus. And that's the way we tear down that wall of separation. So um, we're not going to cast out uh, anybody from our group. Don't forbid him. No one can work a miracle in my name uh, and then speak evil of me. He's on our side. For he who is not against us is on our side. If they're casting out demons in my name, then they're really following me, even though they're not here in this immediate group. And then whoever gives you a cup of water to drink in my name, because you belong to Christ, assuredly I say to you, he will by no means lose his reward. He'll be blessed by God. That's your critical thing right there. I don't care if it's denomination, non-denomination, whatever. Are they doing it in the name of Jesus and do they belong to Jesus Christ? So when I have somebody say, well, I'm not part of your group, etc., I say, do you love Jesus? That's all I want to know. Do you love Jesus? Yes, well, I do too. So we have nothing to argue about. And let's go on and celebrate what we have together. All right, he goes on to say in verse 42, uh, here his purity is being seen. He wants to talk about making sure that we're free of sin. Whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to stumble, it'll be better for him if a millstone was hung around his neck and he was thrown into the sea. If your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better for you to enter into life maimed rather than having two hands to go to hell into the fire that shall never be quenched, where their worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. And if your foot causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life maim rather than having two feet to be cast into hell, into the fire that shall never be quenched, where their worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. And if your eye causes you to sin, pluck it out. It is better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye rather than having two eyes to be cast into hell fire, where their worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. He's trying to warn about sin. And he's making three very graphic pictures of how bad sin is. And he says in verse 42, do not cause a little one to stumble. Because if you do cause that one to fall into sin, better to take a millstone. We've all seen pictures of millstones. If there's a donkey pulling the millstone, there's a big stone base and that donkey has a pole strapped onto its neck and it's pulling a second stone on top of that. They put the grain between those two stones and that action of that donkey pulling that millstone would cause the grain to crack the head from the, uh, the kernel from the, uh, from the shell and that's how they would uh, break that down. Take that big huge millstone, put it around your neck Take a leap into the Sea of Galilee and go straight to the bottom and count as far as you can until you die. You're better off than leading somebody into sin. Now, a little one, who's he referring to? Children? Sure. Sure, anytime you try to lead a little child into sin or uh, away from Jesus Christ, that certainly is sin. That's bad. A little one can also refer to any believer trying to get anybody to sin. 
That's a bad situation. Don't do it. And um, regarding sin in your own life, he says, if your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. Better to enter in, into life, meaning eternal life maimed, than having two hands and going to hell, which is the word Gehenna. That's the lake of fire. It goes on and on. It's never quenched. And their worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. Uh, that tells you about Gehenna that that lake of fire is going to go on forever and ever and ever. There are those who say, well, it's only, you know, maybe they're going to be able to be through prayer. They can go into different states and purgatory and all. No. It is appointed unto man once to die and then the judgment, the Bible says. You've got while you're here on earth to receive Christ as Savior and Lord. If you don't, then you're going to eventually end up in the lake of fire. And uh, as far as this matter of sin, He's not telling us to literally cut off our hand. And that's important because we think, well, I know that. But unfortunately, we uh, are very close and work with a ministry in New Hampshire which works with kids who have addiction problems. And about 10 years ago, one of the young men who was trying to overcome addiction and what have you left a class and he was going to another class and he stopped by the woodworking shop. And he was troubled about sin somehow in his life and he took the saw and turned it on and he cut off his right hand. And obviously he was in shock and the whole place was in shock and uh, terribly, terribly grieved over that experience. That's why I don't hesitate to say he doesn't mean it literally. Because with only one hand that this fellow has now, he could still sin with one eye with one foot. But what he's trying to do is shock us and say sin is so bad that take drastic, drastic measures to make sure that you deal with that sin. Otherwise, if you don't, you'll end up in the lake of fire. Now, all sin is forgivable except the sin of refusing Jesus Christ. That's the unforgivable sin. So if you do sin, confess it. 1 John 1 9 says if we confess our sins he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. But if we don't receive Christ and we continue to sin it isn't really that sin that sends us to the lake of fire. It's the sin of refusing Jesus Christ the sin bearer. And if you refuse him then you have no hope and that's when you go to the lake of fire. And then finally he says Purification is important. Verse 49, everyone will be, will be seasoned with fire and every sacrifice will be seasoned with salt. Salt is good, but if the salt loses its flavor, how will you season it? Have salt in yourselves and have peace with one another. So he uses the analogy of these sacrifices. The sacrifices before Christ came were put to the fire to cover sin and they were salted. So they were salted, not so much for flavor, but to remove the blood. Today, kosher meat is ritualistically bled. The, it has to be a certain way that the animal is cut. And uh, it is also salted to bring out all of the blood uh, so that there is no blood because God said the life of the animal is in the blood. You, do, you are to respect life and not eat it. So... Um, that was uh, the Old Testament Leviticus 11. But for us, he is saying, I want you to be seasoned with fire and I want you to be seasoned with salt. Now, how can I be seasoned with fire? Realize that fire is the work of Jesus. John the Baptist said the, he'll baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. As my late mother used to say, Lord, turn up your furnace another hundred degrees and burn out of me all sin. So, Lord, burn out of me what is not right. Whatever he doesn't burn out of me here, whatever I do and I don't repent of it, I don't confess it, will be brought before the judgment seat of Christ and be put in the fire and be destroyed there. I will not be destroyed, but that reward will be destroyed by fire. So fire cleanses, fire purifies. Salt also purifies. And we ought to have salt in ourselves. What good is salt? I've got a mountain of spices at home that would choke you. I've got them from the, from the East and the West and the Middle East and, and the Caribbean. I've got all sorts of spices. I'll tell you something, with all due respect to all nationalities, nothing does it for me like salt. 
Salt enhances flavor. I put on this the Caribbean and the Moroccan and whatever. Say, ah, give me the salt. It, it does something that nothing else will do. It really seasons. But you know, salt also purifies. We talked about it's drawing the blood out of that animal. It also sp- it keeps things from spreading. They use salt in making bread. And what does that do? It cuts the fermentation process. It keeps it from spreading too much. And so we, as salt, not only enhance the flavor of the world by introducing Jesus Christ, making it a better place. It also helps to check sin. As our prayers and our lives help to check the flow of sin and uh, the purification process is better because we are salt in this world. So salt has a number of great properties, but you know, it can get stale, it can get exposed, and then it's good for nothing. And then you throw it on the pathway to kill a little vegetation, that's about all it's good for. So we have to make sure that the fire is working in our lives, the Lord is purifying us, that I'm still salty. And how do I stay salty? By staying in the Word of God, by staying in prayer, by staying in fellowship with other believers. So here we're talking about Jesus, and we've covered His revelation of Himself, His person. Jesus is God, He is Lord, and He's teacher. We saw his power as he rebuked the demon and he taught and enlightened the disciples. We saw his humility and his death, talking about how greatness is really serving other people and how we should love others and not look down our noses because they're not part of our particular group. Uh, And uh, purity, get rid of sin in our own lives and live lives that are purifying to the world around us and to the Lord as well. So good counsel for us, the more we know Jesus, the more we know what he wants to be in our lives. And this is all about Jesus being seen through us. He does not want us to imitate him. We can't. He's divine, he's human, but he's divine. We cannot be God on our own. We can't watch him and follow him like a son tries to follow his father. All we can do is get ourselves in a position whereby He lives His life in and through us. And that comes by confessing our sins, calling upon Him to be our Lord and Savior. And if you're watching by television, listening by radio, if you don't know the Lord, it's very simple. Confess yourself as a sinner. The Bible says we've all sinned and come short of the glory of God. Call upon Him to come into your life, live His life in you, and then He will do what He wants. He doesn't want you to be perfect. He wants permission to simply come into your life and live his life in you. He says in Revelation 3, I stand at the door, the door of your heart, and I knock. And if you'll open the door, I will come in and I will dine and fellowship with you and you with me. So with that in mind, let's do that right now. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your teaching here in chapter 9 of Mark. We thank you for revealing Jesus Christ to us as God, as Lord, as teacher. We see his power, we see his humility, we see his purity. Lord Jesus, live in us, through us. Forgive us for our sins, cleanse us from all unrighteousness, and allow us to let your life reach the world around us. In Jesus' name, amen and amen.